everyone, my name is Stonesy Boy, and welcome back to Reading with Stonesy. One of my favorite parts of this channel. Probably the most favorite part, but that's besides the point. Anyways, today we are finally on the good part of this book. And yes, there is a bad part of this book, because in the beginning it's slow and monotonous, blah, blah, blah. But we are on finally the good part of the book, where we meet other characters and all that such, and finally, you know the writer uh, can mess with other characters. We're only reading 14 pages, so it's relatively short, and uh, yeah. So let's begin. Chapter 14, The Caravan, meaning Ramoa, Stax must choose, a disagreement in the night. Stax not better than he had in a very long time. His new wool and mattress was soft and clean. His belly was filled with something that wasn't dried kelp, and no drown squelched by, squelched by his front door, making hideous gurgling noises. In fact, Stax woke up only because he heard bells. He rubbed the sleep out of his eyes and opened the doors of his cabin, completely forgetting to check for monsters that might have survived the morning sun and stayed in the shade under the trees and look around. He heard bells, and not just bells, also the whining of horses, the lowering of cattle, and the braying of donkeys, along with human voices calling out orders to animals, laughing, and even singing. They were coming from behind his cabin, not the direction of, to the seashore. It had been a long time since Stax had heard other person's voice, and his first impulse was to run into that direction, but after an eager first step, he stopped. The last voice he heard was that of Fuego Tempro, and Z and his raiders left Stax to die. What if these were more raiders? He blundered right into them as if he were invited, in a, to, invited to a picnic. Stax hurried back into his cabin, disassembled his bed, and snapped on his wooden sword. He felt a flush of shame at how pitiful a weapon it was, but it was better than nothing. He carefully shut the door of his little cabin, gave it a pat of thanks for keeping him safe, and headed towards the meadow. As he expected, the sounds were coming from the groove in the grass that he thought had been the road. Stax approached slowly, eyeing at the animal and the people going past. There were donkeys weighed down with chests, cattle accompanied by dry drovers yelling hee hee and chick chick chick, sheep chariot along by barking dogs, and traders in scrumptious robes, some to his robes looking down at their noses from atop sleep muscled horses. Stax stood and watched the parade of an amazement. For one thing, he'd never seen such a caravan. There weren't many in the part of the overworld he'd called home. For another, he was a little stunned to hear people and animals again. After near silence and the solitude of ocean and desert, the caravan seemed incredibly busy, a live thing pulsing with noise and color externally with motion. Hi, Stax called out, his voice sounding rough and strange to his ears. Hi, hello there, hello. At first, nobody noticed him except for a tamed wolf, who quickly determined it was neither a sheep nor a threat, and that it was therefore unimportant. But then two herded men saw him standing among the trees, the back stiffened in alarm, and one of them reached his sword at his waist. Then he seemed to think better of it, elbowing his companion and pointing a stag's direction. The two swaggered over in the car while the caravan passed behind them. What are you then? The tower one asked. Beggar? Hermit? Madman? I'm not any of those things, Stag said, the words spilling out of his brain faster than his mouth would give them the word form, and threatening to tumble over one another. My home was destroyed and I was marooned on a desert shore. What's that? Quit mumbling, you shaggy ruffian. Whatever you are, stay out of our way and off the road, or you'll pay the consequences. This one ain't no threat, Shigam, his order, shorter companion said. Why, look at the, uh, his sword's made of wood, hand-carved by the look of it. Shigam peered at the sword at the stack's waist and grinned, showing his yellow teeth. Ha ha, you plan on fighting an apple, friend? Or doing an envelope? Ha ha ha. My home was destroyed and my possession, Stax began, but trailed off. It was obvious the two men were listening. Ritzo, Chigum, what's going on here? A newcomer with a slim young woman wearing a green tunic above pale blue trousers. She had a bow over her shoulder and a quiver full of arrows tipped with bright yellow feathers. Her hair was curly and black, spilling over her shoulders, and her eyes were gray and a pale face. She had spots of red in her cheeks, and she frowned at the two guards. Nothing, Romoa. Just keeping this vagrant off the road, Ritzo muttered. Vagrant, asked Ramo, appearing at Stax. Is that how you describe yourself, sir? What? No, my home was destroyed and I was marooned by pirates. I tried to get a home across the Sea of Sorrows, but I couldn't find my way and came to this way instead, from the desert. That's where I was marooned, in the desert. Ramo had listened to explanation with her lips pursed and her head cocked to one side. Stax was aware that he was rambling, but couldn't seem to stop talking with someone else again felt so strange. You rode here from the Sea of Sorrows, Ramo asked. That would mean you were marooned on a desolation bay. You were a brave man, Mr. Stonecutter, Stack said. Stack Stonecutter. For a while there, I was afraid I'd never see another living soul here ever again. 
See your sorrows? Bye, said Chickum. This one's lying or crazy or both. Leave him, Ramoa. We've got a job to do, remember? Yes, we do, Ramoa said. We're a caravan, Chickum. A caravan is made up of travelers banded together for protection. And Mr. Stonecutter here is a traveler. That means he's welcome to travel with us, if he wants to, and lend us his skills for the greater good. Greater good, scoffed Ritzo. His weapon's a sharpened stick. His weapon's flammable. And some of us have no weapons at all, Ramoa said. Are you good with animals, Mrs. Stonecutter? Yes, said Stax. I raise sheep and cows and pigs and chickens at my home. And cats. I don't think we're driving any chickens or cats on this trip, Ramoa said with a small smile. But we've got plenty of the rest. Why don't you walk with me? I want to know more about how you survived Desolation Bay. A crazy woman and a cat herder with a pretend sword, Ritzo said. You two are perfect for each other. Ramoa scowled at Ritzo and Chickum departed. People need people, she said. For the moment, she looked sad. Even flea-bitten louts like those two. One day, they'll figure that out. Well, anyway, come walk with me, Mr. Stonecutter. Okay, Stack said. But can I ask where you're going? The remote laughed. Knowing where you're going is always a good idea. They're bound to Tumbles Harbor. It's a big town to the north, a couple of days. Walk up the coast. They have been a big fair every month. That's where all these animals are heading. There's a mining company and a lot of else besides. A mining company, Stacks asked, and Spears is lifting. Tumble's extracting or something like that, Ramoa said. I don't know. I'm not totally, a, not really a miner. I don't feel right if I don't look up and see the sky. Well, Mr. Stonecutter, would you like to join our caravan? You're welcome to, and frankly, I'd recommend it. These lands are unforgiving for a traveler without proper gear. Sykes considered the compass dropped by the raiders was pointing east and heading off to the course of the couple days didn't seem right. On the other hand, he was, was he really going to face Fueg and his warriors with no armor and a wooden sword? And perhaps there's another way home. If Tumbles Harbor really had a mining company, someone there might know his family and is able to tell him to get back to the Stonecutter Estate. His father might even set up one of the outposts there. Tumbles Harbor sounded like the kind of place he was likely to have visited. Mr. Stonecutter, I hate to rush you, but I have duties to attend to, Ramoa said, hands on her hips. Are you coming with us, or we? is this where we say farewell? Sax looked behind him to where he could see the walls of his little cabin amid the trees. He reached into his pocket and felt the compass that might lead him to Fueg, and he looked at the animals and the drovers heading north. I'll come with, with you, he told Ramoa, who smiled at him and inclined her chin for him to follow. Ramoa led him toward the back of the caravan. The drovers waved to her and tugged at bales of their caps, but they seemed to regard Stax uneasily, muttering to themselves or averting their eyes. Nobody here seems to like me, Stax finally told Ramoa, who shrugged. You look like a wild man, Mr. Stonecutter, he said. Your clothes are covered with salt and torn. Your shirt's burned through in the center. Your boots are falling apart, and you've got ragged beard. Stax ran his hand over his chin and discovered his stubble had indeed grown into a patchy beard. I hadn't realized, he said. I must like, I must look a fright. You certainly a striking figure, Ramoa said with a little laugh. It's obvious you've been through quite the adventure, but the people in our caravan don't want adventure, Mr. Stonecutter. Or, can I call you Stax? I suppose, said Stax, looking in the direction of his cabin. Would you prefer Mr. Stonecutter? Miss Ramoa asked, raising an eyebrow. No. What? No. Stax is fine. Stax was aware he wasn't making the best first impression, or second impression, maybe. But it was faintly shocking being among people again. He still wasn't sure he made the right decision by joining the caravan. If you're feeling normal, formal, my name is Ramoa Perenzi. But don't be. It's just us, anyway. Stax, these people just want to get their animals and goods to Tumble's Harbor. And they want the journey to be unexciting as possible. Thing is, the overworld doesn't always cooperate. But I don't need to tell you that, seeing as you survived Desolation Bay. I don't know what that was its name, Stack said, but you know it in the Sea of Sorrows too? Yes, Ramo said, dangerous places, particularly the Sea of Sorrows. It's crawling with drowned, and the old ones have several monuments there. Difficult to find a safe route through there, even weather in good weather. The old ones, Stack said, rubbing his chest. So that's what they're called? One of them gave me this burn. What? That's what they're called in this part of the overworld, Ramo said. Other people have given them different names for them. I've heard them called Elder Guardians, Fire Eyes, and Sea Lords. Even met a wayfarer who came, he built a house out of Prismarine taken from the, one of their monuments down around Porto Reigns. But I never saw the house with my own eyes, so I won't swear that one's true. Desolation Bay, the Sea of Sorrow, Porto Reigns, Stax repeated to himself. So, do you know what's beyond the Sea of Sorrows? To the west, I mean. Somewhere out of the way where there are ice flows in the green country of forests and meadows, kind of like this one. That's where I need to get back to. Stax looked at Ramoa, hopefully, but she shook her head. I've only traveled to the eastern end of the sea, she said, my country to the south of it. And it's far safer to travel by staying east of the Shining Desert, even though it's a long way around. But one day I'll get there, Stax. I won't be happy until I've seen the entire overworld from pole to pole to end to end. The entire overworld, Stax said. Is that even possible? No, it's not, Ramo said. But I'm going to do my best I can. It drives me crazy to think when I breathe my last there will be places, so many places I never got to. 
Don't you ever think that way? No, Stack said. If I'm lucky enough to get back home, I'm never leaving again. Really? How can you say that? I mean, I'm sure your own country is lovely, Stax, but oh, the places I've seen. Lava falls in the moonlight. Mounds with roots in the sea floor of tops that lie beyond the clouds. Great rifts in the earth with diamonds and emeralds sparkling on the walls. Islands in the blue sea. Carpeted with flowers, those colors hadn't, I hadn't known existed. Stax shook his head, but Ramo was looking off into the forest, her mind far away. Sometimes I wish I were a painter, so I could just capture these things and share them with everyone, she said. But sometimes I'm glad that I'm not. There are too many beautiful things in this world that people want to keep for themselves. I like seeing things that are too big for that, and that no painting could do justice. Places there only been you can look do is look, and promise yourself that you'll remember. An hour or so before dusk, the caravan's leader passed down a word and pres procession would stop for the night in broad meadow between two rivers. Ramona and Stax dropped back at the end of the lie and helped herd the cattle into pens that had been hastily constructed. Campfires were blazing and Stax smelled beef cooking and heard songs of laughter. Campfires were blazing and Stax smelled the beef cooking and heard songs of laughter. These are my favorite moments on the trail. Ramona said. All the people are together and we can look back on another day that we kept each other safe. Stax nodded. The last campfire he'd seen had been a raider's, but this felt different. A group banded together for mutual protection, as opposed to a band of rogues seeking to do harm. The caravan's guards, including Stax and Ramona, were assigned to the outer perimeter and would sleep in shifts. Before first watch, Stax excused himself and watched a saw in his hair in the river, then returned to the campfire with his hair cut short and his beard gone. This smooth chin felt strange to the touch. Why, Stax, you look positively reborn, Ramos said. Except for these rags, Stax mumbled, as suddenly embarrassed by his worn, salt-stiffened clothes and his wooden sword. You can fix that when we get to Tumbles Harbor, Ramos said. Everyone who does guard duty gets credit at the general store, and I'll make sure you're on the roster. Well, thanks, Ramos, Stax said, sitting by the fire. Beef was sizzling on spits, and we hoped that he wasn't actually drooling with anticipation. He looked over at Ramoa, figuring he should say something, and then realizing he was badly out of practice and figuring out what was something he should be. So, will you be going back south after the fair? No, I'm meeting with a good friend, Hajira Ten Boots, in Tumbles Harbor. Hedgie's been exploring the northern jungles and said he wants me to see them. Hey, you should come with us, Stax. Stax shook his head. I have to go get home or find Floyd Tempro. That's the leader of the pirates who destroyed your house, Ramoa asked. Yes, Stax, said Stax, and fished a compass out of his pocket. He left this behind. Or maybe it was one of the raiders did. I thought I could use it to get home. My father always took a compass on his journeys, but it was wrong. But I was wrong. Now I'm thinking I can follow it to find Fuego. Ramoa took the compass and examined it with what looked like stacks like a practice eye. That's a costly thing to leave behind. You need both iron and redstone to make a compass, she said. That makes you think you can use it to find Fuego. Well, it's his, isn't it? Ramoa looked at him questioningly. I never used a compass before, he admitted, knowing he sounded offensive. I never had to. This one's always been pointing east. I figured that's because that's where Fuego is. Ramoa shook her head. I don't use compasses. I prefer to navigate by the sun. But I could explain how they work if you like. Okay. They're oriented toward the origin point of the overworld, Ramoa explained. To the place where the priests say people first came into existence. So if you're using one to find a place, you'd have to know where that place is in relation to the origin point. Ramoa handed the compass to Stax, who stared down for a moment. So that was where, what his father had been telling him, the relationship between the Stonecutter Estate and the Origin Point. That had probably been the simple formula, one his father had committed to memory. But Sax hadn't been listening, and now the secret was lost. His father would have written it down somewhere in his library, but those books had been burned and carried away. So using one to find a person, Ramoa said nothing, allowing Sax to reach the answer on his own. Sax tucked the compass back into his pocket and kicked the ground angrily. The compass would get him home or help him find Fuego, making all, it all but useless. He thought briefly about throwing it into the fire, but stopped himself. Perhaps he would trade it for, it for something in Tumbles Harbor. New clothes or a sword that begun life as a tree. A drover brought him chunks of beef spitted on sticks. Sax took the skewer, a grateful nod, and gnawed on the meat greedily, wiping the juices running down his chin. First guard shift is about to begin, Ramo said after they tossed their sticks into the fire. Come, keep me, keep watch with me. All right, Stax said, but after the moment's hesitation with Ramonois, I try to help people, she told him, getting to her feet. And once again, saw, Stax saw a trace of some old sadness in her face. I'd like to help you, if you'll let me. I, sure, Stax said. Sorry, it's just, well, it's been a lot. I get it, Ramo said. You probably trusted Fuego Templo, and look what that turned out. But you'll see I'm okay, or at least, I think I am. Come on, Stax. Stax followed her to the edge of the firelight. The sun was down and the moon was rising. Stax could see its light glittering on the waters of Desolation Bay. To the west beyond the trees, in the other direction, he would see rolling hills and the mountains rising beyond them. 
The biggest threats around here are the skeletons and spiders, Ramoa said, taking her bow off her shoulder and inspecting its length. Anything I see, I'll take down as long as it gets to us. Your job is to make sure I see everything, and if I should miss, whack him with that sword of yours. With my fearsome wooden sword, Stag's asked, what good would that do? More good with fists than, or harsh language, Ramo said. But don't worry, I won't miss. So why am I here? To keep me company, for one, Ramo said. So you tell me about this fake tempo. But only if you want to, of course. Stax found that he did want to. Standing on the edge of the firelight, he let the story spill out for him. From the Blake's arrival to the raiders destroying his house to the harrowing ocean voyage, and he endured while marooned. Ramo listened gravely, only interrupting to ask more about the drowned and Stax's dangerous encounter with the undersea monument and its guardians. Hold on a minute, Stax, Ramo said, as Stax was telling her about the decision to head east instead of west. Things are going to bump in the night. Stax followed her gaze and spotted a slim, slim white figure under the trees, a skeleton holding a bow. Its head swiveled madly, and Stax wondered if it was seeing and thinking. Did you, I didn't know the firelight meant people. Did it hate them for being alive and walking under the sun unharmed? Or did it simply follow some un ancient instinct about thinking at all? Strange creatures, Ramo mused, selecting an arrow from their quiver and smoothing the feathers. If you ever get into a shootout with one, hold still. It feels like the wrong thing to do, particularly once the arrows start flying, or the excellent at tracking movement and lousy at hitting a stationary target. Stax nodded, his eyes riveted in the skeleton. Ramoa knocked her an arrow on her bow, slide, slide along the shaft, and let the arrow fly. It thudded into the skull and the skeleton froze, trying to get a fix on its attacker. Ramoa had already drawn another arrow in the moment she had practiced in a smooth. The second shaft buried itself between the skeleton's ribs. The monster saw them now in his mouth open, though Zax heard no sound. It knocked an arrow with its own bow, remote third arrow against her chin. It flicked her eyes, so Staxon smiled. Remember, don't move, she said. The skeleton fired its bow. Stax flinched, but the arrow went wide with a considerable margin. Before the skeleton could draw another, remote fired her own arrow and the creature collapsed. Any more of them out there, she said, asked Stax who was still staring at the spot where the skeleton had fallen, awed by Ramoa's skill with a bow. At some point during the archer's duel, he'd drawn his wooden sword. He put it back in his belt, hoping Ramoa hadn't noticed. I don't see anything, Zack said, scanning in the darkness. Good, Ramoa said. He had returned to her bow and her shoulder and was walking through the grass, eyes searching ahead of her. She returned with an arrow of the skeleton that fired, brushing the dirt away from his tip. She handed it to Stax. I've never fire even fired a bow, Stax said. Oh, I can teach you. The best way to keep an enemy from hurting you is to take them out from a distance. Now, you were telling me about this desolation bay? So, Stax told her about the rest of the story, ending with his building with the little cabin, hearing the bells. You should be proud of yourself, Ramo said. Most people would have given up, but you never did. So, what are you going to do now? Stax had been thinking about that, and his answer? Go with the caravan to Tumbles Harbor. If it's a big mining town, someone there may have heard of my family. So you may be even able to help me get home. Ramo frowned. I've wandered a big chunk of the overworld, and I've never heard of the stonecutters, or anything like that place you call home. So what if it doesn't work? What then? Then I need to go after Fweg, Sack said. And to do that, I need better equipment and supplies. I learned how to mine as a kid. Someone in Tumbles Harbor will be able to make se make use of me. I never heard of Fweg either, Ramoa said. They stood in silence for a minute, with the stars spread out over their heads. You don't think my plan's a good one, Stack said, sensing Ramoa might have thought that it was reluctant to say it. It's not that, Stax, Ramo said. It's just that the overworld is huge, infinite, some say. You could spend your entire life searching for this flag and never find him. I don't want you to spend years and years for a quest that'll probably fail through your own no thought but your own and leave you bitter and angry. So I should just accept what this man did to me? I don't want you to spend years and years on that quest and probably fail through no fault of your own and leave you bitter and angry. So I should just accept what this man did to me? I should just let him get away with it? He took your life away, Stax. I get that. Don't let them take your future, too. Stax felt himself getting angry. Ramoa said he was trying to help. But what did she know about me he'd been through? Through everything that Foy had done to him. Sounds like you got a lot to figure out. So what should I do instead? Come with me and hedge. It's a big world. There's not terrible things in it. I don't need to tell you that. But there's so much beauty, too. Let me show it to you. So I should just run away? That's not what I said. Well, it sure sounds like it to me. Maybe running away is your answer to your problem. But I don't think it's mine. Now Ramoa sounded angry too. You don't know anything about me, Stack Stonecutter. You don't know what I've been through or how I've dealt with it. You're right. I don't, Stack said softly. And you don't know what's as much as you think you do about me. So I think it's better if we just keep watch. He could feel Ramoa's eyes on him. And wonder if she would say something else. But if he wanted her to. But after a moment, Ramoa turned away and spent the rest of the drive duty in silence. Oh, how sad. I hate it when friends argue and fight. <sighs>
Well, can't be helped, I suppose. Anyways, next time we're reading from 1 16 to 1 40 130 136 so 16 20 pages exactly oh come on 1 16 to 136 Come on, 136, right? 135. All right, whatever. But yeah, hope you guys have a fantastic, wonderful day. Be polite, be efficient. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.